Hi, Angular 20 is already released and as usual, it brings so many new and cool features and improvements. Today, I'm going to share with you my favorite feature, the one I was waiting for quite a long time. This feature makes creation of dynamic components in Angular much more cleaner, consistent, and also brings some new opportunities we didn't have before. So let's get started straight away. To demonstrate the new features, I prepared a simple application and very quickly I'm going to highlight the most important implementation details. So whenever the user clicks the Create Component button, I dynamically create a widget component. The widget component is relatively simple and it has a bunch of inputs. It has one model input to enable two-way data binding with some other property outside the component, and it has a very basic output that emits when the user clicks the close button inside the widget component. Once the component is created, I immediately set up the required inputs and subscribe immediately to the closed output. Once it emits, I simply destroy the component. As simple as that. But now we are approaching the tricky part. And my goal was that whenever I switch the collapsed state for the widget component, I want to sync its new value with the state of this checkbox and vice versa. Whenever I change the compact mode signal by ticking the checkbox, I should update the collapsed signal state in the widget component. So in short, the values have to be always in sync. And this is a perfect scenario for two-way data binding, which has an elegant and lean solution for the template syntax. But it is quite opposite for dynamically created components. And if you are not familiar with the concept of two-way data binding in Angular, the thing you will see later, it might be quite confusing for you. So I would recommend checking some of my videos where I explain the concept of two-way data binding in detail. But in short, you can imagine the model as a declaration of the input and output at the same time. So whenever the input value changes, it emits an output with this new value, which should be eventually assigned to the property you want to keep in sync. Because the template two-way data binding syntax is not available here, we have to do all this two-way data binding synchronization manually. And for that, partly responsible this block of code, where we perform initial value synchronization between the widgets collapsed property and the compact mode signal. And also when the value of the collapsed property changes, we update compact mode signal with this new emitted value. But this is still not enough because this particular synchronization here happens only once and it is not reactive. So we need something like an effect to track changes in the compact mode signal and then update the widget's collapsed input whenever change happens. All right, so this is the current implementation and we can immediately highlight a few disadvantages in this code. First, the handling of two-way data binding is very cumbersome. Secondly, there is no unified style to work with dynamic component inputs and outputs. The third issue is that the current output API requires us to access the class output property directly, which doesn't respect their output aliasing. And it is different from how it works in component templates. And the last issue is that this code is not reactive. It is very imperative and it would be nice to have something more declarative and reactive. So how we can make it better in Angular 20? Starting from Angular 20 in the create component config, we've got a new property called bindings, where you can define input, output, and two-way bindings. For example, to create an input binding, 
you can use a function called input binding that has to be imported from Angular core. And the first argument of this function is the name of the input. And the second argument is the input value. For the value, you have a few options. If the value is supposed to be static, it can be expressed as a regular function that returns any value. Or it might be a signal and you can use it if the input is supposed to dynamically change later. So currently for title and description, I'm okay with static values. So for the description input property, I'm going to use the same approach. So here we go. And this notation, as you might already guessed, is the same as the one we have here. So I can remove those two lines. An important take is that once you start using the input binding API with the particular dynamic component, you cannot use the set input API anymore. So if you save the current change and then go and create the widget component again and open the browser console, you will see an error that tells you exactly that. This means that once I started the migration to input binding, I have to do it for every input for this component. So let's migrate also the collapsed input as well. And here I would like to highlight a few moments. So first, when you use set input, you have to unwrap the signal to get its value because otherwise you provide just a signal function instead of the signal value, which is not what you usually want. But for the input binding function, you don't need to unwrap signal and you can provide signal directly because input binding function will unwrap the signal value automatically. And the second thing to highlight is that input binding will be tracking changes inside the compact mode signal and reactively update the value of the collapsed input, which means that we don't need this effect that we have right here inside the app component constructor, so I can just get rid of it. So now we are done with the input binding migration and we can make sure that we didn't break anything by just going and testing our application and you can see that everything continues working. A quick side note, by the way, you might be curious if the new input binding has an input type checking. And unfortunately, unfortunately, likewise with the set input method, if you make a typo somewhere here and try to create a binding for a non-existing input, you will not get any build time error and you will see the error only at runtime later. However, with some nuances, but this input binding is actually the first step towards to strict type inputs checking. So stay tuned. Now, what about output bindings? For them, we've got a dedicated function as well called output binding, and it works a similar way. So as a first argument of this function, you define the output's name and simply provide a callback that executes the logic you need as a second argument for this function. In my case, I simply destroy the component and let's maybe also set component ref to undefined to let garbage collector remove this destroyed component from the memory. And by the way, if you want to learn more about detecting and debugging memory leaks in Angular applications. I have a dedicated video about that. You can check it out later. But let's continue. And then in the same manner, we can handle output also for the collapsed output as well. Here we go. And then just copy this callback here. And this means that those two output listeners I don't need anymore. And I can simply remove them. So here we go. Again, two things to note here. First, by default, the type of emitted output value is unknown. 
However, if you know what type of data will be emitted from this output, you can define it here as a generic. So in my case, it's going to be a Boolean type. The second thing I would like to highlight is that if you try to save and run this code, you will get a runtime error, which says that there is no such collapsed output. Actually, it makes a lot of sense and who knows how two-way data binding in Angular actually works, they should already guess where the issue is. So the thing is that when I told you that you can imagine a model function as an input and output declaration at the same time, I intentionally dropped a little detail that the output will be publicly exposed not under the property name, but it will be exposed as an alias, which has a name that consists of the property name plus suffix change. And only after that, if you save this change and try to interact with the application, you will see that now it is working without any issues. Now, as I mentioned before, this input-output pair represents a two-way data binding. We simplified it quite a lot already, but we can do it even better and do it with one single line. And we can achieve that thanks to a new two-way binding function. So here you define just a name of the model input, just like that. And the second step, you provide a signal you want to keep in sync with this uh, model, just like that. And if you save this change and go to the browser, you can make sure that everything still perfectly works and my checkbox state is always in sync with the state of the collapsed property inside the widget component, which is really cool. And now let's talk about new features that allow us to do things we couldn't achieve before. So starting from Angular 20, during the component creation, we can apply certain directives to this dynamically created component. And here you have to simply define the directive constructor name. For example, I have a directive that applies some hover effect to the element by adding and removing a certain CSS classes. And once you save this change, you can see that now my widget got support of the hover effect, which is, in my opinion, pretty nice. However, this directive is very simple and it has no inputs to configure. But what if we need to do that? And to demonstrate you this use case, I'm going to utilize the material tooltip directive that allows creating a certain tooltip with a message whenever user hovers over the element where this directive resides. According to the material tooltip directive documentation, we have to provide the message through the dedicated input. So let's do that in our particular case. And because I need an, an additional configuration for this directive, instead of the class constructor name, I'm going to provide an object which has a key type where you define the directive name. And then we have to use all the familiar bindings property. And likewise, we did it earlier. We can use input binding functions to configure their directive inputs. So we can configure their mat tooltip input, which contains text that this tooltip should be showing. We do it just like that. And we can also configure property mat tooltip position and say that this tooltip should appear above the element where this directive attached. And cool, you can see that everything looks great and the directive has been successfully applied and the tooltip is visible when I hover over my widget. As you can see, this new syntax makes working with dynamic components in Angular more consistent cleaner and predictable because it works the same way as it works in component templates. Besides that, it is reactive and tree shakeable API and it's supposed to be rolled out into other parts of Angular like binding definitions in component host element or 
inside Angular unit tests. All right, guys, let me know if you are also excited about this new feature as I do, or what is your favorite feature in Angular 20? Let's discuss it in the comments. If you like this video and you would like to support my work, the best thing you could do right now is to share this video with your colleagues and friends in your social media. And of course, subscribe to this channel if you didn't do it yet. I also offer a bunch of advanced Angular video courses like the one about Angular Forms, where you can learn how Angular Forms are working under the hood and how to create complex form controls like drop downs from scratch and without third party libraries. Link to my video courses and other ways how you could support my channel you can find in the video description. Otherwise, I wish you a productive week ahead, stay safe and see you in the next Angular video.